Let's get those glasses high in the sky because it is last call and we are talking final or cutoff and it is about to start right now. Hey, what's going on, guys? It is Brian and Jack with Simple Man's Comics, and we do a lot of comic and pop culture related content on this channel. So, if you're new here, consider subscribing. This is the last call show where we are talking about books that are hitting final order cutoff this coming Monday, January 27th. You want to make sure you get those orders in by 10 p.m. Eastern. That's when the cutoff is. But I will be fully upfront with you guys. It's kind of a light week this week, isn't it, Jack? It really is. There's a, there's a few books that pique my interest, but all, on the whole, there's really nothing that screams like, go make sure you get your order in for this book. But sometimes these are the weeks that creep up on you because you don't see something coming. Yeah. And re regardless, it's still good to get those pre-orders in because a lot of times you get discounts on those books by doing the pre-order yeah. and you help your LCSs out because that way they know what type of inventory to order. But with that being said, we're going to get into it right now. And the first book we're talking about this week is Deceased Unkillables number one. Now, this answers what that question if the heroes failed and what goes on with the world afterwards. Right. It's kind of giving you a different perspective on this deceased story that we just got from Tom Taylor. And you're getting kind of the street level view. Um, we're getting a three issue miniseries kind of showing it through the Red Hood and Deathstroke's perspective. And I mean, is there really anything cooler than the Red Hood and Deathstroke when you're talking about DC Comics? Um, this one kind of piques my interest, to be honest with you. Deceased is an interesting um, kind of like ebb and flow of collector interest. And I think my interest in the series kind of goes along with how collectors have felt. I was at first looked at it like, well, this is a Marvel Zombies kind of duplicate, right? They're just trying to keep up with the competition. And then... As time went on, I was hooked. I was brought in with the variant covers, but then the story actually ended up hooking me. Um, and by the end of the series, we saw this book go from variant buzz section on the Bolo list to the reader buzz section on the Bolo list. And Tom Taylor did an amazing job. Tom Taylor, who's also known for doing Suicide Squad for DC Comics, but he did an amazing job on this series. And uh, I'm not surprised they're going to bring it back for some miniseries and some. Uh, I think a, a second volume or another uh, um, kind of like main continuity story, but we're getting the same deal here, Brian. We're getting awesome Putri variants. We're getting amazing Matina variants, and we're going to get a story that I think is going to be kind of a fun departure from typical DC Comics continuity. Right, and as you see on the screen, there's three different covers for this. You have that cover A by Howard Porter, who does a lot of the Flash covers. You have that cover B, that horror homage by Yasmin Putri, and then of course that cover C by Francesco Mattina. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 103. We're starting to get big into the storyline again. And this has got three different covers for it. As always, you got that regular cover, that Kevin Eastman cover, as well as that one in 10 variant for this. Well, you know what, Brian, before I talk about this issue, I got to tell you, you know what really excites me about the hobby right now is, you know, when we, you and I first started on the mic, we would talk Ninja Turtles and we would hear a lot of negative talk about Ninja Turtles as, as you know, it's cartoony, it's kid stuff. It's not, you know, real comics. It's not what we should be talking about. And then City Here's at to them. War, right? <laughs> City at War happened. Um, and it seemed like the entire comics community started paying attention. And what really makes me feel good is that beyond City of War, we're still talking Ninja Turtles. Stores are still investing in store exclusives. Um, the community is still paying attention. There was uh, a lot of talk about a Turtles' first appearance on the Bolo Show just a couple weeks ago. This issue may have a few first appearances in it. We're not sure. It looks like um, Old Hobbs, who's debuted within this IDW series, who, if you're not familiar with, is a mutant cat. Um, kind of at odds with Raphael all the time. Um, it, he looks like he's going to have some some henchmen. So, uh, you know, the importance or long-term, we don't really know. But 
this has been a great series. I'm excited. And we talked about this leading into the big issue number 100, the monumental moment, which was, I think, a, just a amazingly written issue of Ninja Turtles. Going beyond that, issues 101, 102, 103, 104, 105, we're going to really set the tone for where the Ninja Turtles are going for the next several years. And I think that these issues are of paramount importance. If you're a Turtles fan, um, if you're reading this series, uh, it, these issues are really going to uh, set us on our, our next direction. Yeah, not only this series, but I'm actually really enjoying the Power Rangers Ninja Turtle crossover right now yeah. as well. Yeah, really, really well written. And then, of course, here we have my favorite franchise. We're talking He-Man with He-Man and the Masterverse number f- Masterverse. Masterverse. <laughs> <laughs> With He-Man and the Masters of the Multiverse number four. Tim Silly, great writer. Everyone knows him for some horror comics. I've been loving his writing on this series. This Inhyak Lee covers for this series has been phenomenal. But what I like about this number four issue is we are diving deep into that filmation universe, that cartoon that everyone fell in love with, that made them want to go buy the toys. That's why they made the cartoon to merchandise to go, hey, let's make a cartoon, get the kids who want the toys. Well, I'm 42 years old now, and I still love that cartoon and still want the toys, but we're diving deep into that universe, and I can't wait to see how this issue plays out. Yeah, and this is the thing, Brian. Uh, you know, you and I talked about this book several times on this show as well as other shows, and the beauty of this series has been it's really been presented in this kind of like Masters of the Multiverse style that is so similar to the Spider-Verse um, that is a real kind of like light introduction for a new Masters of the Universe fan. And that has, I think, brought in a bunch of new readers. But this issue right here, like you mentioned, this is for the OGs, this is for the hardcore. This is for those who were indoctrinated some 30, 40 years ago at this point. And, and this issue right here is gonna be all about the He-Man that you know and love. Legion of Superheroes number four. Of course, this is from DC Comics, but this is going to be an all-new Secret Origin book. That that intrigues me, especially from a reader perspective. I've actually been enjoying this series. It's got that regular cover by Ryan Sook, but what I like on this as well is that cover B, which is from Alex Garner. Yeah, I love that cover too, but I got to be honest with you, Brian. This one for me is a reader buzz pick. This is uh, for my kind of like, hardcore DC reader fans who are kind of jumping into this brand new, I'll almost call it a Bendis first that we've got going on here with uh, Wonder Comics, the DC label imprint. Um, but it's, it's really funny. This is an issue that could very well piss off some OG Legion of Superheroes <laughs> fans because we're going to get uh, kind of a Bendis origin, uh, kind of a, a, a secret origin of the Legion of Superheroes. And you know, if Bendis is going to take over a property, and in all fairness, a dead property. Um, while there may be nostalgia for the Legion of Superheroes, it was a property that was doing absolutely nothing on the, on the market, whether we're talking the publishing side, the secondary market, or TV and, and film. There was no Legion of Superhero talk. And Brian Michael Bendis is an A-lister, certified whether you love him or hate him. And him taking over this property, you knew he was going to put his fingerprints in it. Um, so... I think things like this are to be expected. It'll be interesting to see how big or small this is. Either way, as a DC Comics fan, I will be reading. Yeah, Legion of Superheroes is one of those titles I put like a, for me, from reading perspective, I put like a step above like Freedom Fighters and some of those other teams. But it's always good because you actually at least you get characters that you know and love kind of mixed up into it. But I've been enjoying it. Um, they John Kent brought Damian Wayne into it, but either way, yeah, definitely reader pick, but I do like the Alex Garner cover. Yeah, and you mentioned some of the character names right there. Um, I think that that's why I'm reading it. I'm reading it because I, it's never been a property I'm necessarily too hype about, as you can kind of tell from what I just said, but at the same point, I think the future of DC Comics may be contained within this, this team. So it's important, I feel like, to get as familiar with these characters as possible as a collector, a as a fan, and as an investor.
Now this book, I'm going to have to say, it's probably the one I'm most looking forward to in this whole video right now. We're talking about On the Stump. This is a new series from Image Comics, and it's talking about how elections are now being handled, and it's basically fisticuffs out in a place called The Stump. Kind of, to me, has like that shirtless bear fighter type feel, maybe a little bit of Southern Bastards, but it's going to have the regular cover by Prinzy, but each one is also going to have a connecting variant. Yeah, and, and you know, Sanford Green, of course, is part of the uh, popular team behind Bitter Root. And that is not, you know, to be taken lightly because this book is written by Chuck Brown, um, who is part of the team behind Bitter Root. So this is kind of going to give you that, that sort of feel. If you like Bitter Root, I think you like this. I like the Southern Bastards um, comparison because, you know, they, they both use the same colorist with R Rico Renzi. Um, and also Chuck Brown is a Columbia, South Carolina native. So he's very... Um, entrenched within the Southern comic community. Um, so I think that, that that is a good assessment. I also think this book is going to be interesting. I get like almost the comedic aspect when you hear the solicitation where I get that shirtless bear fighter vibe too, where it's like, this is almost silly, but I think it could be very dark at the same point because, um, you know, the stump, obviously when we're talking about, you know, in terms of today's modern politics, you're talking about when a candidate is campaigning and they, they, they take the the podium to kind of, pitch their ideals or in today's day no and age more talky, talky. <laughs> their talking point yeah and uh today's day and, age, and then in this in 1868 it isn't about you pitching your uh policies it's about you throwing those hands so um you know this is going to be interesting uh i think uh it'll be a bloody mess but uh, i imagine it will be um fun and i think there'll probably be some hidden message in there somewhere but i i expect this book to be a good time yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to it. Yeah, Jay, if you ever meet Chuck Brown at a convention, good dude and always down to talk about his work. So uh, be sure to find him in Artist Alley this summer. Then here we have this book from Valiant, Dr. Tomorrow number one. This is going to have six different covers for it. But one we like to always talk about is one, that bundle variant, right? You always talk about that with the subscription, get the bundle variant. And then there is a 25 copy incentive variant for this. But Jack, you're the Valiant fan. And this is kind of like you were talking about before where, what, they can have a new number one each month? Yeah, new number one each month. They're really trying to grow the fan base and they're doing it for the right reasons. This isn't a cash grab situation. This is a brand, a publishing company that is trying to familiarize a, a ever-changing comic community. We talk about that on the channel all the time. Like there's so many new people coming in. So they're trying to give them an opportunity. And we also talk about writing styles and how today's typical writing style that the trend is moving towards is these kind of uh, mini series, almost seasons, the Mignola verse style. And that is how Valiant Comics generally publishes their books these days. Um, Dr. Tomorrow is a book I'm actually kind of excited for because I know almost nothing about this character. And not a lot of people do. This is an obscure Valiant character that was actually created by Acclaim. And you may be more familiar with Acclaim for their work in the video games world back in like the Sega Genesis days. But Acclaim actually had the rights to Valiant Publishing. They're actually the ones who, um, I believe, went into bankruptcy with Valiant. Um, but they, for a brief period of time when they were making Valiant comics, debuted the character Dr. Tomorrow in this year of heroes of 2020 that Valiant's rolling out, they're taking a lot of characters couple that they've kind of had appear before um, that were in different incarnations of Valiant comics. And, and because this is a whole new continuity, they're revamping those characters. And Dr. Tomorrow is a prime example of that. And that's a tough to find first appearance, but either way, you can also make the argument that this is a first appearance because this is really a whole new different version of this character. Um, I think this will be a fun book, a book to check out. Uh, you know, you almost get that like speed racer look from the character and some of the art. Yeah, um, like speed racer or like Astro Boy type. Yeah, yeah. Almost feels like Hanna-Barbera-ish to me. Uh, we were just talking Hanna-Barbera yesterday. But um, I kind of get that vibe from this book. And that's one thing that I really, I talk about this a lot. Um, one thing I love about Valiant Comics is there really is a book for everybody because they go out of their way to have characters who tell different stories and, and come from different backgrounds um, and they go out of their way to find writers and artists who can depict these characters and these stories 
um, kind of how they should appropriately, regardless of you know whether or not that fits in a perfect puzzle together. And I think that really works for Valiant Comics. I encourage you. This year, we're going to be talking about a lot of new Valiant series. This might not be the one for you, but when you when you hear one and it, it intrigues you, give it a try. Not very often we talk about Dark Horse on here. We do from time to time, but we're talking about it right now with that new Matt Kent written book. Bang, this is going to be a five-issue miniseries, right? It's going to have the regular cover as well as a Matt Kent variant. Right, and I'll tell you myself personally, I've gone on record. I know on this channel talking about how Dark Horse isn't really my thing. Having said that, I'm actually excited for this book, and you mentioned the main reason, Matt Kent. Um, over 2019, I think Matt Kent has really become probably in my top three favorite writers currently doing it. Donnie Cates, Chip Zdarsky, Matt Kent. I think those are, for me, the, the writers that I enjoy the most currently. And um, I've talked about Matt Kent's kind of storytelling style where he, he can bring you in, whether it's Valiant Comics, as we just talked about his work there, um, some of his creator own stuff that we've talked about, whether it's Folklords with uh, Boom Studios. And here, you read the solicitation and it sounds very busy. You're talking about a best of the best secret agent with memories he couldn't possibly possess, a mystery writer in her 60s who spends her retirement solving crimes, a uh, man of action with mysterious drugs that keep him in constant string of targeted disasters, and a seemingly omnipotent terrorist organization that might be behind it all. Um, and they're all connected to one man, science fiction author with more information uh, than seems possible. So this is, seems to be a story about a man who wrote this book that seems to have come to life or seems to be predicting something. You, you can't tell. It's just there's a lot in that solicitation. But Matt Kent's writing style, the way he walks you through things, um, I, I feel very, very good going into this book that this is going to be interesting. And he always imparts some humor in no matter how dark a story it can get. So I'm going to check this one out. I'll be on board uh, for issue number one. And I also like Matt Kent's art style. So I'll probably grab that Matt Kent variant as well. Yeah. <laughs> Jack put this one on our list and I was like, bang, dark horse. I was like, really? I was like, yeah, it's a light week. And then we yeah. went and looked and opened it up. I was like, oh, Matt Kent's writing. I'm in. Getting back over to DC, but not just that normal DC. We're back over that black label, especially that Joe Hill. But we are talking about Plunge Number One. This is kind of a regular cover, as well as a Gary Frank variant. Right now, we've talked a lot about these Hill House imprint books on the DC, uh, kind of under the DC black label, DC Comics, um, kind of family of, of imprints, and. This is another one where I read the solicitation, Brian, and I say, man, this is a movie, right? You know, uh, you have a tsunami and a vessel disappears. And then when it reappears, uh, they're a little shocked that it's 40 years later. Um, that sounds like a, a, a premise you would see a movie. Um, at the same point, we've said that now for several of these releases, they have not taken off. Now, they've gotten solid reader buzz. A lot of people really are liking these stories. Um, but it seems like retailers are prepared for this. Retailers have been ordering these books kind of heavy. When I don't include them on the Bolo list, I do get feedback from people saying, oh, I really like this book or that book. But Brian, you and I were just talking before we went on air that a lot of these books we've seen on the 75% off sale list, set, whether it's Midtown, TFAW, um, that you know a lot of the larger orderers of new product, I think they've been overstocked, if anything, with a lot of these books. Um, and I think a lot of the initial kind of hype came, if I'm being quite honest, with a key collector alert that said uh, that, you know, just hypothetically, the new DC HBO Max thing could turn out well for Hill House. That could be where Hill House ends up, which was really speculative, but people kind of took it like the other alerts that it was maybe rooted in some fact. And it may be, but that's not the way key collector presented it. Um, and people kind of jumped on some of those series early. They got kind of higher printed. It'll be interesting to see as these series continue to come out, if some of the print runs drop, if maybe the supply and demand ratio of these books change. Either way, from a reader buzz perspective, these books have been fun. I'm a little behind on the Hill House books, 
Um, I tend to read issue one and not keep going. Um, so I've got to keep going. But um, at the same point, uh, you know, we always like to let you guys know our perspective on things. This is not something I would say, get excited and go, oh man, it sounds like a movie. Let me grab 25 copies. I think these things will be available and they may be available cheaper um, than even they are at initial offering because that's what we've seen so far. Yeah, I, I think you'll definitely get a good story out of it. And I do love Gary Frank, so I'll probably pick up that variant. But like I was telling Jack before, this is, it's one of those ones where I think the story will be good, but I'll be glad that I read it once and not like pick it up as far as going, man, I'm happy to have this yeah. in my collection type thing. But either way, we are interested or I'm, I'm interested in the story and I'll probably, like I said, pick up that Gary Frank. So you can't keep a good man down. And here we are. We have Wolverine number one. I'm not going to mention all the covers for it. There's a lot of Marvel covers. There's a lot of store exclusive covers. But what I will talk about is, if you're looking for some store exclusives, our channel sponsor, Frankie's Comics, has some great ones up there. We got that Clayton Crane. They also have that Tyler Kirkham 181 homage. But Jack, Wolverine number one, how many times are we going to get a Wolverine number one? Oh, an unlimited amount of times. Uh, don't think this will be the last. And this is also why death issues are never worth any sort of long-term investment because no one stays dead, especially if you are of name the way uh, Wolverine is. I think only a certain type of character, like maybe Master Splinter will stay dead, but I, I, maybe Alfred will stay dead, but Wolverine wasn't going to stay dead. Yeah, that's like uh, giving away free money. Yeah, yeah. Nobody does that, right? So uh, here we are back printing money um, and uh, probably printing money by the, by the 100,000 because uh, there will be hundreds and hundreds of thousands of copies of this book. Um, some of the variant art is amazing, uh, whether it's the, the Jim Lee variant or the um, Del Otto variant, just absolutely amazing. But again, we talk about integrity right and we talk about you know community so we want to talk to our community with integrity and be like be cautious with this one this is one of those be cautious releases buy what you like have fun um if you just you really want that delato variant you don't care grab it because it's it's awesome um it's so awesome i almost cursed right there but at the same point um if you're buying it and you care like you know I, you don't want to overspend or you know you know, you're, you're looking at it and you want it to, you know, mature in value, um, be cautious because Wolverine number one is as no brainer of a book as there is, right? I mean, it's, of course, we were going to talk about it on the show. Of course, every show is going to talk about it. Everyone's going to buy it just to check it out. Um, and every store is going to order tons of copies. And because of that, these variants are not going to be difficult. They're going to be out there. Furthermore, you have those store exclusive variants. Um, and you're going to see a lot. If you go look around the market, you're going to see a lot. And um, a lot of people uh, do it a lot of various different ways. So shout out to Frankie's Comics. One of the reasons why we love to deal with them is that the level of integrity that they have. But you're seeing variants, whether, they, um, whether you're seeing them online or you're seeing them from uh, retailers or you're seeing them uh, through various different um, subscription programs or any number of places where you're seeing Wolverine variants. The reality of the situation is every single store that orders these books is ordering 3,000 copies. And when you order 3,000 copies of a book, um, you're going to get a just large stack of these incentive variants. So these, you're talking about 3,000 cop copies of a book you're going to get all those one in 25s, all those one in 50s, all those one in 100s. And the market becomes very saturated with these books. When you see places saying that they're going to sell um, a limited number of 500, 600, 800, what they're frequently doing is destroying the excess amounts of books, or at least telling you they're destroying them. Um, and it doesn't change the amount of incentives that exist on the market. If they, if they destroy 2,500 of a regular Wolverine variant, um, a store exclusive that they create, it doesn't mean that there's any less. They still got 3,000 copies worth of that incentive. So I think that the Delato will struggle because of that. Um, I think the Jim Lee long-term may have a good chance. 
um, because some of the hidden gems long term have done pretty well. But, you know, be cautious, uh, buy what you like, um, and uh, maybe wait this one. Because if you're looking for some of these variant covers, I think that they're going to be there and you can kind of find it at your cheapest possible price. And I would even suggest look at these retailers who are selling um, store exclusives. A lot of them will be selling incentives. I know Frankie's Comics does it. They do a lot of times well below ratio. Um, check those stores out and uh, you know shop with them because a lot of times that's the cheapest possible price because they've got the largest quantity. Yeah, I definitely look at this. This is a PC book. Um buy the cover that you like whether it's store exclusive or it's incentive or even the regular covers but either way it's definitely a, a personal collection type book i don't see this as a book that will be highly investment type book yeah but that's, I mean, did, that's did, not did. the point of the hobby anyways just we always say buy what you like and enjoy what you and enjoy what you buy All right there hasn't been a wolverine number one since the 80s that's been worth investing in. So I wouldn't expect that to change now, right? And the last book we're gonna talk about right now for Final Order Cutoff is Bloodshot number zero. I'm not a big Bloodshot fan, Jack's a big Bloodshot fan, but I'm starting to read it. And you wanna know why I'm starting to read it? because that movie's coming out and i think this is a good book this is booking up right up right before that theatrical release another thing a couple picks ago we talked about how great a writer tim seeley is and how big a fan of it we are guess who's writing this book it's tim seeley but bloodshot number zero we got three different covers for it tell us more about this book jack go it's time to get on board the bloodshot train. He is everything cool. <laughs> right. He is everything cool that us, um, you know, people growing up through the 90s loved about comics. He is Punisher at Punisher's best, but he is Punisher if Punisher was already dead. He has nothing to worry about. Uh, Gino Toretta Punisher is how I see it now. It is, it is just, <laughs> Gino Tourette. <It's>, uh, uh, <laughs> Gino Tourette, that's the Heisman Trophy winning quarterback. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, I thought that after I said that. Who's yeah. the Thoughts and Furious one? Tourette? Uh, yeah, what's it? Uh, what's his first name? Gino now. <laughs> it's the Miami quarterback. Fuck them Canes. From the 90s. Now we're aging ourselves. Go Knowles. <laughs> But uh, <laughs> fuck me all up. But uh, you know, I'm keeping all this in. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, so yeah, so you know, I think you talked about the movie. Come come March, everybody is going to be on board. Um, I'm fully confident about that. I think pushing the movie back a month to get it out of like the dead month of February, the month that traditionally does the absolute worst. Yeah, wasn't um, it also I, going up against another movie that was? Yeah, I mean, it, it was it was going to be coming in a time where it was going to be like uh, back to back to back, uh, kind of like pushed back Similar. blockbusters. Yeah, yeah, Birds of Prey, uh, Bad Boys, and stuff like <laughs> you that. Said blockbustering to Birds of Prey. I pushed back blockbusters. You gotta, you gotta <laughs> pay attention. It's blockbusters that kind of the studios were like, eh, this ain't gonna work, but. They try to move it and kind of separate it from that. Uh, Sony has high hopes for it. They feel really good about it. The producers in the movie feel really good about it. McFarlane Toys finally has the, the brand new Vin Diesel uh, sculpt bloodshot action figures, which look incredible hitting stores. Um, at the same point, we're going to be dropping this bloodshot zero. And you know, zero issues, they tend to be kind of like the origin, right? They go back and tell you that it's a good jumping on point. Maybe you missed the first part of this bloodshot arc that's been going on since 2019. Um, we definitely talked about it. We talked about the Kevlar variant. We talked about all the coolness that goes into bloodshot. When we talked about you know, issue number one on the last call, but maybe you missed it and you want to get caught up and you don't know where to start. Issue zero is a great jumping on point. All three covers feature fantastic cover art. Um, and I think that the, here we're going to get like a little, uh, a backstory on, why his mission is what it is, what his mission is, um, what was the point of it. And, uh, you know, I really think that if you pick up a Bloodshot comic and give it a read, and you're at all a fan of Punisher, Deadpool, 
Deathstroke, 90s, 80s Wolverine, these types of kind of anti-hero characters, um, you are going to love Bloodshot. Bloodshot is everything that's great about 80s action movies um, done today. And I'm really hoping that this movie uh, that's coming out, I think March 19th, really delivers on that. But I, I kind of have faith. I think, I think Vin Diesel, this is going to be big for him. So, so it's Dominic Toretto. <laughs> yeah, not Gino Toretto. <laughs> I knew, like, as soon as it says that, I said, I think that's the quarterback. Yeah, I was going to let you go, but uh, Arun from Boom Studios would have killed us if we, if we uh, yeah. mis misquoted anything Fast and Furious related. He's like the biggest Fast and Furious fan probably out there. Uh, of all time. He went to the premiere of the cartoon, the Netflix cartoon. Yeah, he's like, he's got those like fake tattoos, the <laughs> lickums and stickums. <laughs> Bloodshot number zero. I've actually been reading this latest in fat past few issues of Bloodshot. Part of it's because Jack, Jack's talked about it enough to where I've gone like, okay, what am I missing here? And I've gone back and read it. And I am looking forward to the movie. I will say that. Movie I, looks think, good. I think the movie is going to hit with a certain crowd. And I think then that crowd will head to the comic shop to kind of check out what maybe they've been missing. So there it is. Like always, those are our 10 picks, but now we also have those additional printings, especially with some boom books, right, Jack? That's right. And that's where we're going to start it out. Something is killing the children has been an absolute smash hit and sales have actually continued to increase as this series has gone on. Part of that is because of the additional printings being able to bring in new readers. So what is Boom doing? Well, they're going back to print with issues number one, number two, number three, and number four. Issue number one gets a sixth print. Number two gets a fourth print. Number three gets a second print. Number four gets a second print. And I already know the Boo Birds out there are going to get upset and they're going to say, oh, Boom's trying to milk the collector market or the speculative market. Honestly, that's not what this is about. This has nothing to do with you. So if you're a speculator, you can just sit down. This is for the readers. This is for those who missed out on this book. This is an attempt to increase sales of issue number five. That's what this is about. This is about issue number five. Retailers cannot sell issue number five if they don't have issue number one, issue number two, issue number three, issue number four in stock. So they need to have these books in stock. Boom is trying to listen to retailers. They're trying to listen to the demands that Diamond is bringing them. And I commend them for doing it. You can react to it how you want, but that is the point of these printings. This is for the readers. Um, and I imagine there'll be some secondary market buzz either way. Beyond that, we get into our regular schedule. Schedule program. Right, later printings. And another book that's going to uh, a, a multitude of printings. We have Undiscovered Country number one going to a fourth print. Uh, those covers have been very cool. We've got Undiscovered Country number three going to a second print. We've got Avengers 29, that star brand issue, going to a second print. We've got Excalibur number five going to a second print. Fallen Angels number five going to a second print. Seems like every X book goes to a second print. Ruins of Ravencroft Sabretooth goes to a second print. Star number one goes to a second print. Symbiote Spider-Man Alien Reality number two goes to a second print. And X-Force number five goes to a second print. So there it is. Those are the additional printings. But as always, if you want to see that full final order cutoff list, you can go to simplemans.com. You can go to simplemanscomics.com. We have the full comic book. We got toys. We got all types of there's other books up there, graphic novels, trade paperbacks. That full FOC list is up at simplemanscomics.com right now. And with that being said, we will tell you that next week there will not be a last call episode. I will be on vacation with my family in the happiest place on earth, Jack's apartment. <laughs> Just kidding. That's We're actually lot. taking the family going to Disney World. Not that Jack's apartment isn't a happy place. I've never been there. I couldn't tell you. <laughs> but I will tell you, kids will be enjoying rides. My fat ass is going to be enjoying all that great food at Disney World. If you haven't been, definitely go check it out. You all know I'm a big fan of Disney. Love it. But I'm looking forward to this vacation. But in its place, we are going to have a bunch of great content next week. We're going to have that Morbius back issue list we've been talking about. We're also going to have a Bolo Rewind where we take a look back at the whole last year of the Bolo Show. The Bolo Show is a year old now. If you haven't been checking it out, it is on this channel. and It comes out Thursday nights, 9 p.m. 
We pre-record it just like this show, and that's covering all the newest comic book releases of the week. But we also have something else that's very special, especially for wrestling fans, don't we, Jack? That's right. We're coming to you again with another Indie Spotlight interview. This time we sat down with Jay Sandler, who just dropped the kind of cult popular uh, wrestling I don't even know how to describe it, but a, a, a amazing wrestling independent book on Mad Cave Studios over the ropes. It's really awesome. If you're a wrestling fan, this is a no brainer. This is probably the best wrestling comic I've ever read as far as written by a person who knows wrestling. If you've never been a wrestling fan, this is just a great comic book. that tells a great dramatic story that I think will help you to understand why Brian and I are so into wrestling. Um, and, it's one I can't recommend more. And he's also got another book that's getting some buzz coming out on Mad Cave Studios in March, Hellfighter Quinn. And that's one to be on the lookout for. Yeah, I will tell you, if you read Over the Ropes in this interview, he gives us 10 fantastic wrestling Easter eggs that you may or may not be aware of. So definitely check that out. With that being said, thank you guys for watching so much. Integrity and community, you guys are the best Make up the best community. We love each and every one of y'all. Click that thumbs up button for us. And if you're new here, consider subscribing. And we will see you on the next fantastic video.